Welcome to The Brave Place, where we journey into the lives of brave men and women who have beat the odds or who are in the trenches right now. Difference makers who have truly discovered the warrior that lives within and are living it out. This is the place that will inspire, encourage, enlighten, and challenge that brave person that lives deep down within all of us. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Brave Place. I'm your host, Christy Rodriguez, and I am so pumped up about today's conversation because if you want to listen about introverts and extroverts, this is the place because I'm talking to an introvert and she's talking to me, an extrovert, and she just came out with such an amazing book. This is one of my dearest friends. Her name is Holly Girth. She's an author. She's a best-selling author, Wall Street Journal author, licensed counselor, and life coach. Holly co-founded the blogging community Encourage, and she co-host the popular podcast, More Than Small Talk. She imagines a world where we all become who we're created to be. Holly, you have this amazing book. It's called The Powerful Purpose of Introverts and Why the World Needs You to Be You. I love the title. First of all, welcome to The Brave Place. I'm so excited for this conversation. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Christy. Well, you bet. You know, we've been in the writers group together that you started. How many years ago was that that you started the Man, writers? Group? It's been several now. Okay, I, I would probably say four or five, maybe. Yeah, maybe even yeah. longer than that. I I don't know, but it, it's been such a blessing in my life. But I remember. You know, we meet up at a coffee shop randomly, try to do once a month, each other's houses, that sort of thing. And you, I remember you starting this book and I was already intrigued from the very very beginning because you're a psychology person. I'm a psychology person. You have your degree in counseling and obviously people don't know this, but you actually were one of my counselors. Like, yes. <laughs> Back during my intern days, I think you paid 10 bucks a session. Which I, was did. A pretty I did. I did. I did. I was, yes, I was telling somebody I wanted to go see a counselor and I was really struggling. This was about <laughs> 12 years ago. And they were like, Hey, this church has these interns and <laughs> they're 10 bucks. And I was like, $10, I'll take it. And yeah, And that is where we originally met, which is so crazy to just see where we are today. Just all the things God's done in your life with your books and your writings. And you're just a phenomenal writer. I was reading your words last night to a good friend of mine, and she was like, wow, she's a powerful writer. I was like, I know. She's very gifted, very talented. And and I think even behind all of that, you're such a hard worker. You're one of the hardest working people I've ever seen, which is what takes me into our podcast today, because introverts sometimes get a bad rap, don't they? Yeah, I think we can be misunderstood at times. There's just a lot of myths out there about what it means to be an introvert. And we happen to be in a culture that leans a little more extrovert centric right now. That hasn't been the case throughout all of history. It's not even the case everywhere in the world. But because of that, sometimes introverts can just end up feeling a little bit out of place. So for for you as an introvert, Like, what would you say your struggles have been? I think one of the biggest ones was when I started really publishing, and all of a sudden I got all these speaking invitations. Okay. And I looked around and sort of assumed all these people that were out front speaking, doing these things, were extroverts. So I told myself, this is what it takes to reach people. I just have to make myself act like an extrovert. And so I said yes to everything. I kept traveling. One year I took 20 trips. And at the end of it, I was at a conference. I had given the keynote the night before. And the next morning in Sunday worship, I couldn't stop crying. And I felt like God said, go home, Holly. And I knew he meant get on the plane and go home and take a long nap. Yeah. But he also meant go home to who I created you to be. That who I have made you is the perfect fit for my purpose for your life. And that is true of introverts and extroverts, that whatever God is asking us to do, we are designed for that thing. And that means we don't have to be like anyone else, even the people that we admire most. Mm-hmm. And this isn't coming from just like a the way you're raised situation. That's one thing you go into in your book. You talk about the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. What I love so much about it, number one, it's so just profound and deep in in the mindset of how we think as introverts and extroverts, how we're wired. Introverts kind of hang back, don't they? 
They can sometimes. We lead differently. I say that introverts Uh tend to lead from behind. Mm. So they tend to find a person, a cause, a project, a team that they can champion. And then they put everything they've got into that. But they're not always the most visible. They're likely to be quietly, consistently killing it behind the scenes. So they get less PR sometimes, but that does not mean they have any less of an impact. You say 53% of millionaires identify as introverts. So that's a big aha for a lot of introverts. There was even a 10-year study that said introverts were slightly more likely to exceed the expectations of their boards and investors when it came to CEOs. And that's so interesting to me because it's just the opposite of what would be assumed in our culture. And I think that both introverts and extroverts have tremendous gifts and potential. And so I just never want my fellow introverts to underestimate what they have to bring to the table, whether that's their kitchen table or that is a conference table. Mm -hmm. There's a reference in your book where you say, well, introverts are busy um, planning and, and working towards the goal. Extroverts are working on planning their next party. (laughs) <laughs> and I started laughing and, and this is not to, to dog on extroverts at all because extroverts are definitely hardworking and they always find a way to get it done. But I completely related to that because I thought about my sister who she's total introvert. I'm total extrovert. And how when we were growing up, like Friday nights, she would be studying and she had like a, this bookshelf within her closet that had files of high school papers and it was all categorized and all this kind of stuff. And and I just made a vow to myself, I will never study on Friday night. Like, <laughs> it's just so funny to see the difference. Now today, my sister is just killing it in the business world. She's she's amazing. Um, she's very successful. Um, but we're just wired so differently. And, and famous introverts, like, can you, I know you, you listed some in your book, just throw some out, just so people can know these people are introverts and just the impact that they've had on this world. So what are some yeah. famous introverts? Uh, Oprah is one a lot of people might not guess. Joanna Gaines, Jerry Seinfeld, Michael Jordan, Michael Phelps, Meryl Streep, Audrey Hepburn, Brie Larson, Einstein, Abraham Lincoln, and I think some biblical figures like Moses would probably. We have to guess about them, but Mm. even there. So, Yeah. yeah, a lot of times introverts look like extroverts when they're in a specific role or supporting a cause or person they really care about. Mm. And so, for example, those people are on whenever they're in that public role, but then they want to do different things when they get to turn off and go back to their personal lives. Yes. That that reminds me of my pastor. He he is an introvert, yet he pastors a church and he's a phenomenal speaker. He gets up on stage and in front of all these people, um, but at his heart he's an introvert. And yeah. so that that's exactly what you're talking about. And and I will say every time I know you are introverted, but whenever you get up and speak, I mean, the whole whole room is silent because your words are so deep and, and rich. And that leads me to my other thought that I want to go to that you talk about in your book about how our brains are wired differently, even introverted brains and extroverted brains, truly, like scientifically, biologically, we are wired differently. So tell me about that. Yes. A lot of times we assume that introvert, extrovert is just about personality or people, but it's actually not about that at all. Like you said, our brains and nervous systems are wired differently. So there's three primary differences. Introverts and extroverts rely more on two different neurotransmitters. Extroverts more on dopamine, which acts like caffeine. It revs us up, prepares us for action. It's released when anything from the outside world is coming at us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what makes extroverts feel their best. Introverts kind of have a level of dopamine that already feels good. It's like you've had your one morning cup of coffee and you're like, I'm good. So too much more of all that coming at us feels like you've had an entire pot of coffee. It can be exciting for a while, but then it's exhausting. (laughs) So introverts rely more on a different neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, which works more like herbal tea. So it's released when we do activities where we turn inward, where we can fully focus on a project, where we can have a meaningful conversation with one person, those kind of settings. 
So that's one big difference. Then the division of the nervous system, that same thing we kind of lean toward. Extroverts more toward the parasympathetic, which is, again, that rev you up, energizing. Introverts more toward the sympathetic, which is the relax and calm down side of it. And then our brain pathways. I think this is fascinating. Extroverts use a shorter, faster primary brain pathway that is more focused on the present. Introverts use a longer, more complex brain pathway that takes into account the past, present, and future. Mm. So that means introverts often need a little bit of time to process before they respond, which can be frustrating in situations like small talk, where it's very fast moving and snappy and you get in the car and think, oh, now I know what I needed to say. But the the flip side of that is a real strength that we can bring depth and insight and context to conversations. And I think all of this, we all have access to all of these different parts of our brains and mm-hmm, nervous mm-hmm, systems. Mm-hmm. So you're we saying just, extroverts are not shallow. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but there's naturally one that we go to more readily than the other. I say mm-hmm. it's kind of like being right and left-handed. We use both our hands all day, every day, mm-hmm. but in particular situations or for certain tasks, we're naturally going to use one and we're going to probably have more strength in that. And so that's how it is with being an introvert or extrovert. And none of us are hundred percent introvert or extrovert. Mm-hmm. We're somewhere on a continuum And so we can access all of these things. It's just that some feel more natural than others, depending on our type. Mm -hmm. No, I I love that. And that makes so much sense because... Um, I, I definitely am an extrovert and I can talk and, and go back and forth with people all day. And, and I see my husband, you know, after we've done something like that for, let's say we're at a party or something, we've been hanging out for about an hour. I can see him saying like nonverbal body language. Cause I know him very well. I can see him saying, I'm done. <laughs> like I'm out. And you mentioned that how Introverts can get overstimulated more easily than others. So would you say like extroverts feed off the energy of people around them? Is that a myth or um, and it, it more drains the energy of introverts? Like that's how I would have described it in the beginning. I would have just said, well, extroverts feed off the energy of other people and introverts, they get drained by the energy of other people. And so is that truth? Yeah, it's that dopamine network that I was talking about that extroverts need more dopamine than introverts. And so that energy you're describing is coming from things that trigger dopamine that make that release in your system. Mm -hmm. And so you get to engage with a lot of people. That's like a shot of espresso, you know? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how that works. And introverts, because we don't operate in quite the same way, we just don't get energized by that. And it seems like it has something to do with people, but it actually is just about the external stimulation coming at us. People just happen to be the most stimulating thing in our environment. So it ends up looking like, oh, extroverts are more social than introverts, but that's actually not true. Introverts are just differently social than extroverts. We often care so much that it's overwhelming, (laughs) Rather than, you know, being called aloof sometimes or whatever it is, it's actually the opposite of that. Uh, Introvert nervous systems work like nuts with small holes, so we catch everything. We're often very empathetic and observant. And again, extroverts have these qualities too. But we do tend to absorb what's around us, observe what's around us. And because our nervous systems are so sensitive, our nets tend to get fuller faster. Mm. So that's what's happening. Like when you said your husband reaches a done point, like he literally biologically has reached his done point, meaning his net is full. And until he has time to process, he cannot take any more in. It's just not possible. And so that's why introverts need time alone, because when we have that solitude, then we are able to empty our net by processing and thinking through things, reflecting, and then we're ready to take in more. And again, extroverts reach that point too. Usually they can just hang in there a bit longer. And I've seen you do that. You're great about taking time to reflect and think through things and having that kind of time. So it's not, again, one or the other, but that is sort of what's happening when introverts get to our done point. Mm -hmm. Well, I started cracking up whenever I was reading through your book and you talk about being at this conference with a friend and... (laughs) 
yeah. and and you say I, I look at her and she starts looking at her phone and let me see I'm gonna see if I can pull it up here um, what exactly what you said because I, I took a screenshot of it because I just started laughing because um, <laughs> I realized sh- that girl is talking about me. <laughs> uh, you said I recently went to an evening event with an extrovert friend. At this point, I don't know you're talking about me. And you said, the speaker droned on. I had to make small talk during a break, and I felt my energy leaking minute by minute. My parasympathetic nervous system nudged me toward home. I kept checking the time on my phone as I imagined my favorite blanket, a good book, and my husband next to me. My friend looked at her phone for a different reason. Before the event, she had told me a dozen people were staying with her, only one of them who she had met before. And I just started laughing because I realized, oh, my gosh, she's totally like talking about me right now. (laughs) She showed up at this event. Event. Now she was making plans to meet a different group of friends at a restaurant afterwards. I saw her growing excitement, her sympathetic nervous system driving her towards more, more, and more. And you know what? I remember that night, and that that's so true. Like I was. I had some people coming into town. Um, I had not met most of them, but I, I did know, uh, and they were staying with us, but I did know the people that connected to them very well, and I trusted them. Maybe I was being naive, naive, but I will say that those people ended up being just phenomenal human beings. But um, but I was laughing because that is, like for me, that is so fun. It's like the more people, the more fun. And, and after that, we went and met, some of those people met us with some new people. I wanted them to meet everybody. I love connecting people to people. But that night, I do remember looking at your face, like when we were kind of talking, and I could tell that you were kind of like, wow, like, I I, I have no interest in that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and for a long time, I would have said, I would have been really hard on myself about that. I would have said, I need to be more like Christy. That's what it looks like to be a loving person. Mm. I thought for a long time that being a loving person and even a good Christian was about quantity of people Mm. in my life. Mm -hmm. And then when I couldn't keep up, when I felt exhausted at the end of a night and other people were like, I'm ready for more, I would think, what is wrong with me? Mm. You know, don't I love God? Don't I love his people? And I've had other introverts say the same to me. Like, I feel like I'm not a good Christian because I hit my ceiling when it comes to socializing. And I've had to learn that being a loving person is not about quantity. It's about quality. Mm -hmm. It's about how we treat whoever is in front of us in that moment. Like Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Mm-hmm. But it's okay if for me, it more often looks like one person, you know, in a quieter setting. And yeah. yeah, that makes me a coach and a counselor and able to fulfill some of those roles or spend hours by myself writing and realizing that for all of us, there's not one right way. God doesn't say you have to have this many friends or this many events on your calendar. It just looks like paying attention and valuing whoever he puts in front of us in any given moment. Right, right. And I and I will say too, like me being an extrovert, I do. I I love just pursuing people. I love um those relationships, but I also I know for me I have to withdraw from from life, you know, a lot of different times. And I even feel like as I've gotten a little bit older, I've gotten more like that more than ever. And and I have always been one um I love to sit down one-on-one with someone and have some deep legit conversations. Yeah. And so I also want other extroverts out there who are listening. Again, we're not dogging extroverts here like that you're you don't want quality deep relationships. But I love the the biology behind it that you're talking about. And when you were researching to do this book, was that a relief to you? Did you feel like there was healing that was coming to you because you were saying like before you would have felt like this means I'm not loving people well or loving being a good Christian. So do you feel like there was some relief there and some understanding, like healing that came just in becoming more secure in who you are and who you were created to be? Like as you were doing this book, what what was that experience like? Yeah, it was because I knew some of this on a surface level, but I hadn't done a deep dive into all the research And the more I did, the more it became clear we are created as introverts and extroverts. It is put into us on purpose and by design. And when I look at the creation story, I see so many complementary pairings, day and night, land and sea, masculine, feminine. 
And I think introvert extrovert is another one of those complementary pairings that we balance each other out, that we are better together. I mm-hmm. think healthy individuals of either type, like you just said, can access all the parts of their personality. Mm-hmm. So you can socialize or do solitude. So can I, you know, but that we have certain God given strengths, I think is amazing to me. And so it gave me a greater appreciation for myself as an introvert, but also for my extrovert counterparts to say, I need you because you are different than me. Mm-hmm. And that's a really good thing. Mm-hmm. And I can serve the world best, not by conforming to what I, I think I need to be, but by contributing my unique strengths. Mm-hmm. Because when we are all fully who God made us, that's when we really reflect his image. And I just think that is powerful. Mm-hmm. Well, I love that. And I see this, that theme throughout your book, like it it really truly is about understanding who you are, who you're created to be and living that fully out and and not being ashamed of that or upset about that or comparing yourself to other people. Like you are so uniquely crafted to do specific things. I mean, we all are. And, and I think that is something to be treasured and just enjoyed and, and celebrated, you know? Yeah, definitely. And it helps in our relationships to know if we're in a relationship with someone of the opposite type to understand, okay, this is what's going on. You know, Mm -hmm. this is how we're wired differently. And this is how we can make each other better. I think even we're like the five love languages. Most of us are familiar with that, but it occurred to me when I was writing this book, it matters what volume you speak them in Mm. (laughs) to each Mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. So if you have two words of affirmation, people, one introvert and one extrovert, probably that extrovert is going to appreciate a public way to go well done in Mm -hmm. front of their team at a Monday morning meeting Mm -hmm. where an introvert would probably prefer an email (laughs) that no one else sees that they get to read in the privacy of their own office yeah. or, you know, yeah. just scenarios like that. So even understanding for the sake of our relationships, how we're different, right. I think, and bring a lot of healing and power to you. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think extroverts can just wear introverts out if introverts don't understand how we operate <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and they're not honest and just say, Hey, you know, like, and because you, you make a comment how, how extroverts sometimes feel like we're too much. And, and introverts kind of feel like they're not enough. Yeah. And yeah. really, just as they are, is just on purpose and it's perfect. And we come together, just like you're saying, and, and fully represent who God is, just living our full selves out. I just, I love all of that. And it helps me understand my introvert friends when they're like, you know what, I'm out, I'm done. Um, maybe 15 years ago, maybe even less time than that, I probably would have been like, are they not having fun with the party? Is it not good enough? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Whereas, no, they're introverted. Their neurotransmitters are saying, we're out, we're done. Their nervous system saying, game over. And um, they got to go home. One of the things that you mentioned that I really love is you say, only self-awareness empowers us to see our true identity. And you talk about being self-critical, self-focused, and self-aware. And you you put these three different columns in there and you give examples of what that looks like. And I love this comment. You say self-criticism makes us turn away from seeing who we really are. That looks like insecure, believes others are better than yourself. Others tell them um, who they should be. That's a self-critical person, exaggerates weaknesses, ignores their own strengths. And then you have this self-focused person, which is prideful, believes self is better than others tells others who they should be, exaggerates their strengths. And then there's the self-aware person, which is the the healthier angle here. And this is someone who is confident. They're not cocky. They're not self-absorbed. They're just confident in who they are. Like they they understand who they are. That's a self-aware person. They believe everyone is made in the image of God. God tells them who they truly are. So they lean on God for their identity and not other people. They have a healthy knowledge of their strengths and weaknesses. So there's a reality check there that they're well aware of what they're strong in and what they're weak in. And and you go on to list more and more. And I just thought that was so powerful and such a an eye-opening 
learning experience for me, just looking through all of that and helped me self-evaluate where I am. And I would say you are definitely in that self-awareness category, but I know that you probably haven't always felt like that. And so when you were, so what, what other of those categories could you see that you've been in in the past and how did you overcome that? I still battle a loud self-critic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that my mm-hmm. Enneagram is one and that's the perfectionist. I prefer potentialist, but <laughs> inner critic is our main struggle. And I still have to deal with that every single day and just go back to the truth of who God says I am, not what I feel I'm doing or not doing in any given moment. And so it has taken me a while to realize that self-awareness is not selfish, mm. that it actually empowers us to love well. It looks like Psalm 139, 14, where the psalmist says, I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. Mm-hmm. That's self-awareness. Mm-hmm. It's when we understand who we are in a way that leads to praise, not to pride. Mm. And I think the most self-aware people I know are also those who most appreciate the uniqueness of others. Mm. Because if we're not aware of ourselves, we tend to assume everyone is just like us. And Mm. that leads to a whole lot of misunderstanding. And so in that sense, self-aware people are often the least selfish because they're able to say all of us are who we are on purpose. And the world and the kingdom and life and relationships work best when we're all free to be who God made us. Let me help you become who you're made to be rather than trying to make you more like me. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, that's still, I think that will always be one of my signature struggles that from time to time, I'm just going to have to quiet that inner critic all over again. And thankfully, I, that happens less, but it's still part of my story. Mm-hmm. Where do you think the inner critic comes from? Just getting real personal here. Yeah, I think... I'm naturally wired in some ways that contribute to that. I think the I grew up in kind of a legalistic religious tradition. I think so I picked up some expectations. I'm sort of a natural expectations magnet, you know, instead mm-hmm, of saying, mm-hmm. rebelling, I tried to meet them. So I think that's part of it. And just, yeah, different life experiences and things like that. So what helped you step into that self-awareness category that I see you in today? I think just realizing that I needed to do some work, going to counseling and processing through some things with someone else, sharing with close friends my struggles. We went through almost a 10-year journey of infertility, and I realized I was not in control of my own life. Mm. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. Yeah. (laughs) And there was something I could not perform at that I really wanted to and that I was loved anyway. Mm. And I think that was a big turning point for me. I think a few years ago when I hit a place of burnout professionally and my pace was no longer sustainable Mm -hmm. and I found out the same thing, I was loved anyway, that was transformational. And so I think often the moments where we feel weakest and like the biggest failure become the most freeing because they prove the lies we've believed aren't true. Like Mm. believing if I can't perform or I'm not perfect, then I won't be loved. Mm -hmm. I rationally know that's not true, but Mm -hmm. some part of me didn't believe it until I could not (laughs) meet the expectations Mm -hmm. and found out, oh, I am still loved anyway. Mm. And so maybe someone else can take a shortcut, but a lot of it I've learned the hard way mm-hmm. and then just needing to go back to those truths over and over again and have supportive people in my life who tell me them on the days that I forget. I've literally texted friends and said, I cannot remember what's true today. Will you please tell me again? Yeah. And thankfully we can do that for each other. I think we need the voices of our brothers and sisters to counter that inner critic. Mm-hmm. And then to have that space in our life to listen to the voice of God, too, because for a lot of us, that inner critic is just part of what we deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And and one thing that is so fascinating to me, just just everything you just said, you know, if you go to psychology today and I've referenced this in other podcasts, but 85 to 90 percent of our thoughts daily are negative and and 95 percent of those are repetitive 
So they come back the next day, and the three main categories of those negative thoughts, some people are like, surely not. Surely I don't think 85% of my thoughts during the day are negative. And, um, but if you go back and you look at the three main categories where those negative thoughts come from, they broke them down. And one category is comparison. And one thing I heard just in our conversation today, you, you were saying like in the past, you would have compared yourself to extroverts, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not enough. And that, that fueled this, I'm not enough idea. So there's that negative thought that that's kind of where that's coming from a little bit for you. But, and I'm not trying to just totally like analyze you and well, I kind of am, <laughs> but, um, but one other thing you mentioned is you couldn't control things. Um, you realize you, just with your infertility and that's also the top three categories are comparison and this need to be loved um, and then control. And so if there's things that we can't control, it infuses negative thoughts. If there's ways that we feel like we're not able to be loved because of whatever, we're not doing this enough, we're not doing this right, and we're seeking this love and approval from other people, and then comparison. And just in your whole explanation of how you used to be before where you are today, the self-awareness, and not that it's just, like you said, completely gone, because um, we're, we're going to have those battles our whole lives from from the way we were brought up, um, et cetera. You know, there's always these things that we will battle, but all three of those categories, you hit. Yeah, and, very true. You know, and, and I also think about self-awareness, where it that sounds like a selfish term, self-awareness, just like you said, but really self-awareness is about being aware of your strengths and weaknesses and not comparing yourself to other people, not trying to control things, like accepting yourself fully as you are, and that allows for you to be more others aware. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and so it's really the most unselfish way to be. And and you, you touched on that. In the past, I would look at all these things that I was struggling with that was keeping me oppressed and depressed. And it was all about me. Like this person didn't do this for me or I wanted to be loved here and I didn't feel loved here. You know, I wanted this to happen for me. And whereas today I do see a shift after I work through a lot of that stuff and just saw how self-centered I was after I have worked through a lot of the, these things, it's like, it's the true joy in life comes from when it truly is not about you and it's others focused, you know, and stop worrying about where you are and all that kind of stuff and start helping other people and what they need. And, and in, in return, we find ourselves. I know that sounds really complicated, but moving on. <laughs> Let me see. All good stuff. Good stuff. And adding to what we're talking about, you said when we turn inward, we're not withdrawing or holding back. We're choosing to show up in a sacred space of creativity, contemplation, and imagination. So for you personally... When you're in that sacred space, what comes out? Well, this book <laughs> came out of Well, that. there you go. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the space I write from. I knew in the creation story, God said everything was good. And then he says, it's not good for a man to be alone. And so for a long time, I thought, maybe he's an introvert. I'm not supposed to take that time. Maybe it's not good for me to be physically alone. And I finally looked at the original meaning of that word. And it's not about physical space. It's about living in isolation and separation from God, others, and our true selves. And so you can be isolated in a crowd. It's not about that time that we take apart. So solitude is intentionally chosen time that's Mm. restorative. It actually empowers us to live a more connected life. It connects us to God. It connects us to others. It connects us to our true selves. And it gives us what we need to take back into the rest of our lives. It allows us to make our fullest contribution and to fulfill the roles that we have and serve people well. And so I think introverts and extroverts need the practice of solitude in our lives. And it was a big part of faith culture for thousands of years. And then somehow in our noisy, busy, chaotic world, we've lost a little bit of that. And Mm. so Mm -hmm. I encourage people either schedule it, you know, pull out your calendar and say, I'm scheduling this, even if it's just 10 minutes Mm -hmm. or create a rhythm of solitude in your life. Like Joanna Gaines, who's probably one of the busiest women on the planet, also an introvert, says Mm -hmm. what she does is she pauses and sits in her car by herself for five minutes before she goes into anything new. Mm. And that is her rhythm of solitude. And it's enough for her. 
just giving ourselves permission to make space for that in our lives, mm-hmm. I think is important more than ever. Mm-hmm. Now, can somebody be an ambivert? <laughs> it's probably the most controversial part of my book. I don't believe in ambiverts. I think that because it is so wired into us that we are all on an introvert extrovert continuum. But the research that has followed people in long term studies from the time they're babies when these characters characteristics start showing up through adulthood shows we pretty consistently remain the same type. So we all become a bit more introverted as we get older. We naturally move toward that end of the continuum. Mm -hmm. But I think being an introvert or extrovert is again like being right or left-handed where that's probably going to stay the same Mm -hmm. throughout your life. Only 1% of people are ambidextrous and I would say probably the same about ambiverts. I think most people are introverts or extroverts. I usually find ambiverts that's a term someone uses. They're usually an introvert who's confused about what that actually means. One thing I wanted to ask you about is about shyness. Um, what's the difference between shyness and introversion? Because people will see someone and they'll just be like, oh, well, he's just really shy. Or is he an introvert? Or is it the same thing? Yeah, shyness is not introversion. Shyness is fear of social judgment. Mm. And so an extrovert can absolutely be shy. And an introvert who decides to, you know, take time on their own isn't necessarily being shy because it's not about fear. It's about choosing that particular environment and, again, how we're wired. And so I think that's the biggest distinction. Can introverts be shy? Yes. Can extroverts be shy? Yes. But does shyness equal introversion? No. They're two very different things. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, this has been very enlightening to me. I could talk about this stuff all day. And what I think is so interesting about you and me is we did that, one of those personality tests. You know, I've known you now for about, I don't know, 12 years, 11 years. I I can't, it's been about 12 years, I think. Yeah, it has. Um, And we took this personality test and we have the same personality, except you're an INFJ and I'm an ENFJ. Yeah. So the E standing for extrovert and the I standing for introvert. And I just thought that was amazing because if you look at us today, I'm doing the extrovert thing where I am on a podcast interviewing people, all kinds of different people and talking to people. And you are making an impact with your words in writing and I just think it's it's just really cool how God uses both types of personalities, extroverts and introverts, to get his words out to the world. And just like you said, half the population is introverts, half the population is extroverts, and God uses us all uniquely in, in the way we're wired. I think it's just really cool. Yeah, I think we're better together. We're yes. Better. Well, <laughs> now, Holly... If people want to get this book, The Powerful Purpose of Introverts, Why This World Needs You to Be You, where can they find you? And and also all of your other amazing books that you've written, where can they find you? They can find me on hollygirth.com or for specific to introverts information, hollygirth.com slash introverts, including more about the book and other resources that I've put together there. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're an introvert and if you're an extrovert, you are going to love this book. So I just highly recommend anyone to read this. There's nothing better than becoming more aware of who we are and how we can relate to those that are a little more opposite than us. Also, Holly, one thing I think is really cool is you offer a quiz where you can do what percentage of introvert you are, and (laughs) they can find that. Where can they find that quiz? Same place, hollygirth.com as well. Okay. They can also take a mini course that you have done that is seven ways to thrive as an introvert. Yes. And I think that's so cool. Well, I have had such a blast hanging out with you here today, as always, you know, as the extrovert, I'm going to plan a little Jeep ride and a party in the Jeep. We're going to go get some ice cream and then I'll drop you off probably by 10 o'clock so that you can get your solitude and recharge. Does that sound good? That sounds awesome. Awesome. I love you, girl. Thanks again for hanging with me today and for your time. So that wraps up today's episode of The Brave Place. Thank you all for tuning in. If you have any questions for me or want to comment or you have a brave story, please email me at christy at thebraveplace.org. That's christy spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-Y at thebraveplace.org. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe, rate it, comment within the app on your favorite podcast app and tell your friends about it. So y'all have a great day. God bless you. And until next time, have a brave day.
Thanks for listening to The Brave Place, part of the KLRC Podcast Network. 